I've called this talk from social networking to social mapping. Um, and really what I want to try and do is introduce the potential of internet-based mapping technologies to you. I will inevitably be talking about technologies, but I don't really want to fill your head with acronyms and technology. It's more about trying to illustrate the potential for this, what is a relatively new and rapidly evolving technology. So, as Sue said, I work commercially under Cuttlefish Multimedia, but I also work as a researcher for a PhD research at Pervasive Media Research Group at DMU. Um, pervasive means basically everywhere and embedded in everything. And really, I, I guess the essence of what this talk is about is to demonstrate how technology, in particular some of these social technologies, multimedia technologies, are becoming genuinely pervasive. They're built into various devices, they're built into how we work. But they're also, and it's very interesting to me, is they're developing an understanding of where we are. And as soon as these technologies know where we are, they can also deliver a lot of very interesting, valuable things. Um, now, location, location, location. I've sort of been saying this for the last five years, that this year is the year that location-based technologies are really going to take off. Well, 2009 pretty much has been. Location has become a really important part of people's internet experience. Um, it used to be the case that the internet was said to make location irrelevant. When I started using the internet quite early on in the early 90s, in fact, my research was about making distance and irrelevance, location and irrelevance. So we would set up projects where designers could work together over large distances using some of these early internet technologies. And probably for the first five years or so, it was a repeated sort of statement that on the internet, it doesn't matter where you are, you can be sitting at the top of a mountain, so long as you've got a network connection, you can collaborate with people, you can do your work and so on. And of course, that is very, very true, I think. All of us probably communicate with people over much larger distances now than maybe five, ten years ago. You can have colleagues in Japan, America and so on, subject to time zone differences, you can work together quite easily. Um, however, what I think we're seeing is a, a shift at the moment. Lo location relevance won't disappear, it's a great thing about the internet, but we're starting to see the rise of location being the centre of your internet experience, not the people's use of the internet. And I would say it's about to become the most important thing that the internet knows about you. Where you are in physical space allows a whole range of different services to be delivered to you. Um, I'd also argue really that it's a game-shifting, game-changing shift in how the internet works and how we use the internet. Um, I would not be surprised if in, if in 10 years' time the majority of our internet interactions are location-based ones. That's not because we're necessarily using maybe our static network connections less, but there are more and more opportunities for information to be provided based on your location. So the sorts of things that a location-based service might offer is if the internet knows where you are, then location-based search can become very important. Likewise, navigation. We're probably quite familiar with sat-navs now. Um, but location-based search, if you're searching for a taxi company, standing outside Phoenix Square, you type in taxi company, well it could actually not only make sure that you only get the taxi companies who serve this area, but potentially it could even find the nearest taxi and blip them and say come to this location. Um, we also I think have the potential for what you might call a, a caller location type service. Um, I, I believe that caller ID was probably one of the most understated revolutions in communication technology in the latter part of the 20th century when we went from not knowing who was calling us to first of all knowing their number and then by look up knowing who the person was. The whole way in which we use telephones changed and it was a very subtle revolution. It didn't make the nine o'clock news and so on, but it radically changed how we use a communication technology. Well, services along the lines of caller location where on a simple, simple scale, maybe your phone not only tells you who's calling but where they are, subject to them having released that information or additional services which allow you to see where your social network is in physical space. These could usher in yet more changes in how we use personal communications. Um, we also have the idea of social mapping, which I'll go into in a bit more detail, which is allowing people to map their own spaces for themselves and for the communities they're involved in. Um, an example of that that I often use is a nice new building like this, how you see it as an urban planner and how you see it as somebody like a skateboarding kid is very different. A skateboarder sees a nice ramp coming in, sees some walls that they can slide on and so on. 
Um, they have a very different conception of the space to, well, really, um, myself, uh, urban planners and so on. And I'm particularly interested in allowing people to articulate their views on space and their role within an environment. I'm also going to talk about something called augmented reality, which is really taking a lot of this location-based technology and presenting it in, a, in quite exciting and potentially quite seamless and very easy to use way. And then I'm going to mention the personalised advertising angle, which, if you like, is the driver behind a lot of these technologies. Companies think they know where you are, they know where their products are, they can, for example, you can walk past McDonald's and you'll get a personal advert sent to you to say that just for you, it's half price today and things like that. And a whole range of other potentially horrendous um, services that might be delivered based on your location. <coughs> uh, a number of key enabling technologies have made the growth in mapping um, possible really over the last few years. One of them, of course, is fast mobile internet. We can now deliver high-speed technologies, or high-speed connections to mobile phones and to laptops and so on. Wherever they are, to an extent, within urban spaces, it's normally pretty good. Rural spaces, I was um, at my wife's parents at the weekend, and they haven't got Wi-Fi, they haven't got any mobile phone coverage, and I sort of felt a bit isolated, really, for um, the afternoon. I've got no way of checking my mail or people getting in touch with me. The reality is, for a large number of people, the mobile internet is not as good as it should be, but for those of us who live in cities and larger towns, often it's surprisingly good. In fact, I'm using for today's presentation this little gadget here, which creates a little mobile, a little Wi-Fi hotspot around itself. It connects to the free network and then shares that connection to a number of devices. And apparently it's a technology that you might be interested in, I think, some of your projects. Um, which I think is quite amazing. I get a nice high-speed connection. I can use it on up to five different devices and I pay £7.50 a month for it. Um, so fast mobile internet has been the key enabling technology. GPS, the um, constellation of satellites surrounding the Earth that allow us to, with a fair degree of accuracy, tell exactly where we are on the planet. Um, GPS is now built into most new mobile phones. We start to see them appear in cameras, um, tra tracking devices and so on. The accuracy is something in the region of 10 metres. Also, they don't work particularly well indoors, so it has, it's a very powerful technology but has its limitations. But the mere existence of GPS has enabled a lot of new things to happen. Um, we also have some new mapping services that are providing information at a scale and sort of a level of detail that just 10 years ago would have cost an absolute fortune. Whereas now, for example, I'm going to shoot off to the internet. Let's see if that's still, if our wonderful device is still working. Thanks to wake it up. So we have services like Google Maps, which have easy to use interfaces on the whole. Um, within them, they have an extremely high degree of um, accuracy, and particularly in the in Western areas, but also the majority of the world has at least some Google Maps coverage. And services like this allow us to present information on a map-based um, interface. And like I say, when Google launched this, it was quite impressive, but now, it, as well as having the ability to map, to look at satellite views, of course we have street map emerging now, which is this ability to explore from a street level view a large number of cities around the world. If I grab the little man and just wait for it to load, what this should show me, those little blue areas, are where Google Street Map has coverage. So actually, France is, that's grown quite a lot since I last looked at it. France and Netherlands are doing very well. We haven't quite got much coverage here. But we do have Leicester. <coughs> No, we don't have Leicester, we have Coventry. 